So William, I know it's supposed to be spring, but it really feels like summer. <laughs> Whether it is spring or summer, we have some great gardening information for you next on Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. One of the reasons I'm so confused is the weather's been so great and all the plants are growing and blooming. In fact, there's a showcase of color right out here at the Oregon Garden in Silverton. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing a few stories out here. Coming up in the show today, we share with you some spring fragrant plants. We're also going to show you how to build a raised bed. But first, we tackle the wall. <laughs> You may recall, we talked to Rick from The Wall at the Yardgarden Patio Show. So nice to see you again. Good to see you. So really, this is a lot different than your booth. This is really a job site. This is the real deal. Yeah, yeah we're at it. Yeah, so really, this is a cool project to see um, at an actual homeowner. So what's happening? Well, what we're doing here is a retaining wall project, a stone we call it basalt wall rock. It's local, local rock to the area. And this client actually had the stone here. The rock had been just kind of piled up years ago and uh, he asked what we could do. And we said, hey, that's a beautiful stone wall potential you have there. So we took his stone and now we're reusing it for a stone retaining wall. Ah, and you do do that a lot. You do a lot of recycling with other kind of stone, but that's nice that the homeowner really had all the product right here. Saves him, it saves him <laughs> money because the stone's already here. That's a big cost of the project. So yeah, we try to reuse and recycle every, every chance we get. So did you do all the designing here or did the homeowner have the design? Uh, we we kind of collaborated together. Uh, he knew what he wanted and we just kind of uh, laid things out to put his uh, his dreams into reality. Ah, but you do have design people too if, we, if do. we don't have a clue of what we want. Sure, if, you, if someone needs to put a whole design together with landscape, hardscapes, retaining walls, yes, we can do that. Yeah. And what I really like is that you do everything. I mean, you do the permits if you need them, you if call needed, sure. the utilities, you really do everything. Yes, oh yeah, we try to take care of it from start to finish. If they need permits for the job, uh, obviously, you know, call before you dig, right? right, that's, a, right. that's something that we all, we all have to do in our industry. So Rick, I understand you do walls, so that is a we big do. part of your business, but I'm sure you do other things. We do. We do retaining walls. We do a lot of concrete. In fact, on this project, we're going to install a new set of poured concrete stairs. Nice. So we do driveways and patios and just virtually any type of hardscaping that you can imagine. Yeah. And you do all of that too. I mean, you design it, you bring on the materials and recycle things if you have to. Yeah, design build, of course. And yes, thank you for mentioning our recycled concrete. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're very proud of that. We've been doing that for over 30 years now is uh, reusing uh, old sidewalks and driveways so to build retaining walls. Yeah, well, you probably even set the trend. My gosh, no, we weren't really thinking about that. We, we kind of were the pioneers, <laughs> although if, if you look at some of the old golf courses around town, they stacked up concrete there too. But yeah, we, we did. 30 years ago or so, we started using the recycled concrete and pioneered that. So Rick, why do customers come to you? Why do clients come? What are they looking for? That's a good question. A lot. We have a lot of different needs uh, out there. Uh, this particular client had you know, a retaining wall that really needed to be upgraded. Mm -hmm. And so we're redoing the retaining wall, giving them nice curb appeal. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to make the front of the home look so nice and appealing. Plus give them a nice set of stairs to access his, his landscape and his sure. yard and uh, a couple columns will be installed uh, for a mailbox and then an entry just to create a very nice entryway here. That is nice and so you know we have to talk about budget so you work with people's budgets. We, we sure do and, and budget uh, a lot of it is driven by the material that we use mm -hmm. um, you know we've got various types of material from from block basic walls poured concrete up to you know beautiful natural stone. Uh, and then do you bring samples you have a website? How does we, that all we do we work with lots of you know the local vendors for stone and block and brick and, and of course we yeah we, we typically bring samples out to the client and, and then look at photographs so they can see on site you know on their project. Yeah. Well really this is a great company it's been around a long time and they really can f um, have all the services that you need to make your home beautiful and that you can enjoy all season long. If you have any other questions go to gardentime.tv we'll click you over to their website and you can um, talk to Rick and his staff about making your house beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank you. We're at 
Portland Nursery on Stark Street. And we're really going to be talking today about sharpening your tools. And you know, William, last fall I was really bad and I did no. not sharpen and clean my tools. <laughs> so it's really the great time to do it right now. And I have some Felco pruners and you know, I'm just thinking these are 30 years old and I really try to take good care of them because they were not inexpensive. No. And so with this kind of a blade, it does have a beveled edge on it and I use my sharpening stone here. Mm -hmm. And I can always put some honing solution on it, which really kind of helps facilitate it. Grandpa, you spit, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do that too. <laughs> and all you want to do is follow the beveled edge of that, that blade right there and just kind of go along it several times. You always want to use that same angle and on the back side it's flat so you just want to kind of go straight across and it just kind of takes all the, it just kind of cleans mm -hmm. it up. And then because it gets a little rusty, I'd like to use a little WD-40 right in that center part and it just kind of kind of lubricates it and it kind of cleans that up. Yeah, now you can also sometimes see like on this one, there's some rust spots on the blade itself. And it, so if you take a little bit of steel wool, Ooh, just yeah, get in there that. and you can see it kind of sloughing off. It eventually will come down and be smooth and you would do the same thing with these larger blades. This is a tree saw and it really is rusted and pitted and over years that's gonna ruin the blade. So you just go in, do a quick rub down, and like I said, you can actually feel the difference of the rusted and the non-rusted. And then, if you take a little bit of WD-40, you can just spray on there, and then wipe it off a little bit. Oh, you're really ready to go. And then that makes it a lot safer, and it'll last a lot longer, too. You know, you can use these same kind of techniques on your loppers, your hedge trimmers, and sometimes you have a big burr because sometimes you just have to cut wire with that, and you really want to file that down with a rasping file. Yeah. If you're bad like me, and, and I admit to this, a lot of times when I'm cutting through stuff, I will hit wire, yeah. and it pits the blade so much you can't sharpen it. Now, Portland Nursery on Stark has a complete selection of replacement blades for your Felcos, so you might want to think about investing in that because they really do last a lifetime. Yeah, and one more tip. You know that you always want to have a bleach water solution when you're pruning, if you're going between plant to plant, to do disinfect all your tools. We know you've spent a lot of money on your gardening tools, and so you want to protect that investment. For uh, more information on supplies and great tips, go to your local independent garden centers. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. Gardening makes for wonderful family time. Whether it's updating your landscape or planting a veggie garden, at Portland Nursery, our great selection and staff of professionals can help ensure your family's success. Visit PortlandNursery.com for a list of our classes, events, or sign up for our newsletter. Portland Nursery, let our family help your family grow at 50th and Stark or 90th and Division. Now's the time. Get slam dunk savings on all overstock items at Standard TV and Appliance. Save big now on a Whirlpool washer, only $3.98. Huge savings on a Samsung French door refrigerator, only $12.49. Get a plush Beautyrest Queen mattress, only $3.99. I still got it, folks. Don't miss it. They won't last long at Standard TV and Appliance. Since 1926, the Bonite Company has worked with homeowners to make their homes and gardens beautiful. If you have a garden problem, Bonide has the answer. Don't lose the battle with weeds. The Bonide line of weed beater products will help you get a handle on your weed problems. They are active in cool weather and you'll see visible results in less than 24 hours. Visit Bonide.com to find a local retailer and to download your free Bonide Problem Solver app for your iPhone or Droid. At French Prairie Perennials, we take pride in being different. From our rare, unique, and unusual plant material and handcrafted garden art to our visualscaping program, we can help you create an outdoor living space as unique as you are. Our gift shop has home and garden decor and gifts for all occasions. Visit our store in the heart of Oregon wine country, French Prairie Perennials, Dundee, Oregon. Outdoor living elevated. So I'm out here in Sherwood at Al's and I'm with Mark Biggie and Mark today we are going to be talking about fragrant plants because it's that time of year when they're really starting to pop. They do. Everything's starting to bloom. And it's great. So why don't we start, first of all, lilacs. I mean we all have to love yeah. them so let's start there. 
Yeah, there are a couple different lilacs we have here. Your regular lilac, this is a, a Charles Jolie. It's very fragrant. That's one of the darker purples. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. And what is this other one? It's so this is actually one of my favorite lilacs. It's the Miss Kim lilac. It's a Korean lilac. Yeah. Uh, blooms like crazy, uh, but really nice thing about this is it's disease resistant in this area. It does very good in our climate. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful plant. Now this kind of looks similar, yet it's a, a different lilac altogether yeah, too. Yeah, this is a newer lilac in the last couple of years called a bloomerang. Yes. So the selling point on this one is that it blooms over and over. It'll keep blooming in the summer. Not just once like your typical lilacs will, sure. and just in the spring but this one will bloom a couple times throughout the summer. And oddly enough now, you, you of this collection of plants, you do have some others that tend to rebloom as well, like these Daphnes. Yeah, I love these Daphnes, and actually this front one here, this Eternal Fragrance, is one of my favorites. Yeah. It will just keep blooming all summer, wonderfully fragrant, takes the full sun, is great. This Somerset Daphne is very similar as well. I know, I, right, just standing here, it's like wafting all yeah. over me. It's, it's a great fragrance. Yeah, it smells incredible. And then what is the beautiful little white bloom that's coming out there? So this one down here, this is the Climbs Hardy Gardenia, and it's a hardy gardenia for our area, yeah. which is really nice. Not a real large growing one, a nice compact growing evergreen gardenia. That's wonderful fragrance. Now, I noticed that right at the front, Mark, and you have heliotrope. It is yeah. one of my favorite plants. Yeah, you have to have heliotrope. This is, um, for an annual, it is just a non-stop bloomer. It keeps going all summer, and the fragrance is just to die for. So can I assume, again, Mark, that you guys will have those amazing heliotrope trees that you grow? We will. We <laughs> have them grown in the greenhouse. They are absolutely beautiful, just getting full of blooms, almost Girl, ready. They're, they're really one of my favorite things you have here. Now, what about hardiness? Are, can we assume that all of these are? Yeah, except for the heliotrope. The heliotrope is an annual in this area. Some places it's hardy, but just yeah. not here. <laughs> so um, you have to replant that every year. But the rest of these are all very hardy in the yard. Great. Well, you know, for more information, you can certainly go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to the Owl's website, find the store that's closest to you, and run out and pick up some fragrant plants for your own garden. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, William. So Judy and I are just finishing up planting this new raised bed that our that our good friend Al built. And you know, Judy, what an easy way to put a raised garden in to, is to build it yourself. It is, and really I think the best part is you have fresh soil and you don't have to break your back trying to dig into the native soil here. This tomato is just too easy to plant. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. Now if you're interested in building one yourself, the steps really are quite easy. The first thing you do is just find a place in your yard that gets about six to eight hours of sun if you're doing vegetable gardens and try to get it as level as you can. You know, and when you do those measurements, you want to make sure that it fits and then also that it's not wider than four foot across because you don't want to be walking on that soil that you've just put in there. You want to keep that nice and fluffy. So you want to be able to make sure that you can reach that bed and all those plants from either side of the raised bed. Now once you get those steps down, the next thing is to clear out the sod. If there's lawn there, if there's a bunch of weeds, whatever the case may be, take all that out, and I would do a little tilling of the soil then just to fluff it up. Once the old sod is out, you want to stake out the exact configuration of the raised bed because you want to make sure that you're right on track with what you have to cut. You know that old adage of you measure twice and cut once because you don't want to make any mistakes once you start cutting the boards. That's true, and also you really don't want to use a 2 by 4 Judy. You want to go with a 2 by 6 or a 2 by 8 so you get the depth that you're looking for for the new raised bed. Next, Judy, what he did was, was take brass screws and screwed all the pieces together, making sure that it was square. And you know, he added those extra braces inside all of the corners because it's really gonna have a lot of extra support for those edges. Next, what you do is you wanna make sure it's level again, so he checked all the levels, made sure everything was copacetic. <laughs> And now this is the perfect time to use some of that old soil that's inside the frame to backfill on the outside of the frame because you have a little trench there from all your work. Yeah. Now next, Judy, you know, we've used black gold all organic because this is a vegetable garden and you don't want to backfill with existing soil. You want it to be nice, fresh, clean soil. So we use the black gold. Now you might have a big enough bed too that you want to think about getting a bulk delivery, you know, brought to your house. You know, a place like Grimm's is a great place to get something like that. Now that all that work is done, now you get to plant your plants. <laughs> and this really is the easiest part because you have this nice fluffy soil to play in. It's really, and it's the funnest part too to me. <laughs> and then once everything's planted, you want to make sure that you give it a good deep watering because chances are the soil isn't going to have any moisture in it. So you want to make sure that you have a lot of water for those new roots. You know, Al made this kind of fancy configuration <laughs> in L shape, but you don't have to get that fancy. You can really just get a simple square. And we have one over here to show you. The great thing is, Judy, several independent gardens 
Westerners will carry these garden kits. They're pre-made, they're pre-cut. It is so simple to put together, like this one from Al's. All you do is just place it together, it's pre-drilled, take the rebar and then hammer it into the ground. It oh. couldn't be any simpler. All you have to do is really add the soil and plant water and you're ready to go. It's true, so for more information on building your own raised bed, we invite you to go to gardentime.tv. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. I felt like the entire process was transparent and that they were really honest and open with us about everything and that made it easier to want to purchase. Celebrate spring with that new car smell. Right now, lease the new 2015 Subaru Legacy 2.5i CVT all-wheel drive. An IIHS top safety pick, 10 years running for only $200 per month. I think they want to keep loyal customers and I never got that from any other dealership. Capital isn't on the parkway, they are the parkway. Celebrate a spring tradition. Visit the Holda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs. Tour Holda's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. Look at your home. Winter left behind grungy stained decks, walks, siding and lawn furniture. You know they look awful. Clean them all today with the original and still the best 30 Seconds Outdoor Cleaner. Since 1977, 30 Seconds has delivered clean when you want it clean. Easy to use, spray it on, wait, then hose away winter dirt, grime and stains from algae and mold. From our family to yours, thank you for buying 30 Seconds Outdoor Cleaner. Find it at leading home stores and garden centers. Color, color, color. When you think of your garden, think of color. Then think of Margie's Farm and Garden. High quality plants and great customer service are our trademark. Bring a burst of color to your deck or patio this summer. This week, we have 20% off all our ceramic and decorative containers. It's time to get planting. Vegetables or herbs, hanging baskets or perennials, trust Margie's Farm and Garden. Just off I-5 near Aurora. So I'm here at Little Baja and I'm with our good friend Donna Wright of Black Gold. And Donna, today we're going to be planting up some sedums, but of course we're using the uh, natural and organic Black Gold product. Why, why would we choose this yes, for sedums? We choose natural and organic because the succulents' natural environment is on the rocks and the sides of the mountain. Sure. And they're not used to synthetic fertilizer, they're used to a natural. So in the Black Gold natural and organic fertilizer, we have, you know, it's like earthworm castings that are uh -huh. natural. We have an aloe vera plant that's a wetting agent, and we also have a starter fertilizer pack that's all natural. So it's a perfect environment for them in these pots. So now, uh, we, we got these sedums here at Little Baja, which mm -hmm. they sell. So now we're gonna start to, uh, planting them up. So while we do that, I'm, I'm gonna just chat about them with you, all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so which ones are you planting in that? And why, isn't that a strawberry pot? This is a strawberry pot, but it's perfect for the succulents because they don't require a lot of soil. Yeah. Their root structures are very uh, uh, shallow because, like I said, they grow in the rocky areas of the mountains and um, they take in all their nutrients and all their moisture through their leaves oh. and that's how they survive through the drought period. So then it would be perfect to have a little strawberry pot like that because then they can just sit right in the lips of them too. It is, and clay pots are great here at Lo Baja for succulents. So I think one of the things that I love about getting pottery here at Little Baja, Donna, is because clay pots really, really are great for sedums because they they transfer water easily and mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. along with oxygen, and so there's not a lot of buildup of moisture in the plant themselves. Right, and they do have great drainage. That's yes. the main thing. Is succulents, uh, sedums, do not like to sit, sit in water. Yeah, they're used to that. 
a water flowing past them on the, on the, high, on the sides of the uh, mountain. Well, and I love too that with sedums, you can really be mean to the roots and squish them off like I've been doing right. just to get them to fit in because they're going to fill in beautifully in, yeah. in just a matter of weeks. You can see their root structures aren't very deep. No, they aren't. So you can put them at the very top of things and they will survive beautifully. Now, I'm assuming too, Donna, that all of these are really going to love the sun generally. Yes, they do like the sun and they, and they get the more brilliant colors with the sun. These will stay the creamy yellow like this. And this ice plant that you did, it's a Cooper eye. Um, I, and it's going to bloom purple blooms all summer. See, and, so, and sun, with this yellow, how yes. pretty is that going to be? <laughs> this one's called Confusum, and this is one from the Mexican hills. Beautiful. So it's a beautiful, beautiful bloomer. And, it, and if they get too tall, you just pinch them, and they'll bush right out. And especially if you use this black gold soil, you really do not have to worry about fertilizing no, these ever. No, 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 never do. So this is the perfect environment for succulents. Uh, and also, like I said, the perfect pots to put them in, even if it's called a strawberry pot. Yeah. I've had more success with succulents in yeah, the strawberry true. pot than a strawberry. Well, there you have it. So, you know, you can come on out to, uh, to Little Baja here. You can get the great pots for sedums. You can buy the sedums in the soil and plant up a beautiful pot of sedums for your own patio. It's always fun, Donna. It Thank is. you. Bye-bye. I'm with Logan from Collier Arbor Care, Division of Bartlett, and you always teach us something, Logan. So what do you have for us today? Uh, well, today we've got a great example of uh, stem girdling roots. Wow. Or, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, and this is, you know, more than just that. It, it is a pretty classic um, container-grown tree, mm. you know, that's a, a tree that's been kept in the container for too long. So, it, so you can kind of see this is about the perfect size for <laughs> what, a, about a 15-gallon pot? Yeah, it never yeah. moved out of that space, mm -hmm. did it? Yeah. Um, so, when we plant this out in the landscape, you know, because, you know, trees don't really have feet and they can't move <laughs> around, you know, these roots are always going to be in that same position. Hmm. So this is going to have pretty serious implications for the tree stability and for the overall tree health. So should we have even planted this one? Well, so when this was planted, it was probably about three years ago. The oh. roots were probably a lot smaller then. Uh, we could have actually done something to, to help prevent some of this, but you know, honestly, if, if I did see this coming out of a container, I, I would have sent it back to the nursery because mm. that, that is a pretty poorly formed root system. And then why else could that happen? Just in a container? Are there other mm -hmm. ways that something uh, like this could occur? Well, a container is the easiest way for it to happen you know, because it, it does have those you know, rigid, smooth sides. So once the roots hit the side of the container, it'll just you know, continue sure. to circle around. But another way it can happen is by being planted too deeply in the soil. So roots do need oxygen in order to respirate in the soil. Uh, so if we plant the trees too deeply, the roots are going to start growing upwards in the soil to find that right oxygen content. And because they don't really have a sense of direction, they're just going to branch out because they mm. found that right oxygen content. And that can lead to some stem girdling roots. Uh, the other way that can happen is being planted in uh, too narrow of a hole and, and the roots just kind of hit, hit the side of that, you know, smoothly graded hole and then start circling around like it is in a container. Um, or it could be planted in a, uh, a very compacted soil and, and again, you know, hit, hits the side of the, of the soil and just starts uh, uh, circling around. Uh, so really good tip. So make sure that you amend your soil with compost, make sure mm -hmm. that hole is big enough and make yep. sure it's at grade and not sunken mm -hmm. below grade. Absolutely. So we're always good planting techniques. Mm -hmm. That's really the main thing you yeah. want to do. Yeah. Well, one of the things I do like to describe, you know, when we are planting trees is that root collar needs to be right at the, the, the ground level. So if you kind of picture any kind of drawing of a tree, even a children's drawing of a tree, it's going to have that really Flare. nice zone of taper. Mm -hmm before it gets in the ground. So if we see trees that look like utility poles going straight into the that's ground, bad. that's been planted too deep. Yeah. Well, you have another sample in the landscape mm -hmm. and I think that will give us another great visual. So let's go over there. Yeah. Okay. So Logan, you found this plant, this tree that has mm -hmm. this girdling root. So what can be done? Um, well, so th this is, you know, not quite girdling yet. It's not embedded into the trunk. So th this is a very proactive approach that we're, that we're going to be taking. So because this is, you know, seemingly a fairly fairly large diameter root, we are going to excavate out the rest of that root collar, you know, and see uh, approximately how much of the uh, of the you know root zone that it is, and then potentially uh, cut part of the root off, 
or, or even take it off all the way to here so that this tree you know, can grow in diameter and, and not be hindered by, by that root eventually. So as a homeowner, I'm calling you, you're not going to use spades to do that. You have a special yeah. tool. Yeah, we, we have a tool called the air spade. Um, it's very aptly named uh, and it uses compressed air to excavate out all of the soil and leave all, the, all of those roots intact so we're not damaging roots by you know, digging around with a big metal probe. <laughs> wow, and so is this a, you're gonna fix it now this season or would you possibly have to come back? Uh, potentially, it, you know, depending on what we find below ground, we, we might only wanna uh, partially remove this, this root you know, because it is still providing a valuable function to, to the tree. It's providing a, a lot of structural stability to the tree and translocating water and nutrients up into the leaves. If you notice a tree on your property with one of these kinds of girdling roots, it's really good to call a certified arborist at Collier Arbor Care, a division of Bartlett, to come out and assess the situation. You can go to gardentime.tv, we'll click you over their website, and really give them a call to find out about the health of your trees. Thanks so much for the information. Thank you, Judy. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. U-Haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. Your garden is only as good as the ingredients you use. That's where Black Gold can help. Black Gold Seedling Mix is formulated for successful seed germination and strong seedling growth. Black Gold Seedling Mix is organic and OMRI listed, so you can start this year's organic garden outright. Look for Black Gold at your local garden center or go online to blackgold.bz. Black Gold, all the riches of the earth. Since 1982, The Wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, The Wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. If you have a rose garden, I have a very important contest coming up. I am at the Rose Garden in Washington Park with Harry Landers. And Harry, you know, you have so many hats. So tell us all the different jobs that you do here. Okay, well, thank you, Judy. I am the Rose Garden Curator. I'm also a Royal Rosarian, and I'm on the committee for the uh, Garden Judging Contest. Ah, and so what is that contest? Because it's a really a big scope of a contest. Yeah, it's not as big as people think. It's really easy. It's for the homeowner as well as the business owner. Uh, churches, hospitals can enter their roses in for a contest. Uh, it doesn't cost anything but a stamp. And you can have as few as 12 roses. Ah, you know, I almost have that. Man, I have to look at the criteria there. Because we think, oh man, if we're going to be in this contest, we have to have something extensive. But really, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, it can be roses along your boulevard. Uh, you can have other plants with your roses. Several different categories for just visibility, for miniature roses, uh, for a formal rose garden. And that would be a rose garden that has a a fountain in it, an obelisk in it, uh, a rose planting, but have other roses with it. Um, and then there's churches, hospitals, and also there's the Frank Beach Award that the garden uh, judges. I and my supervisor go around and we stay in our vehicle and we drive past homes and businesses that have entered their garden and they get uh, judged also first, second, and third. Ah, and really, um, this is going on from the Royal Rosarians that you sponsor this. Yes, yes, and they have, uh, the judges are all Royal Rosarians and a few Rose Society members ah. come to the homes and they judge on many different things, but the biggest thing is just the maintenance of the garden, how clean your garden is, how neat it is. Bloom is only 10 points, 
So it's, it's all the other aspects that go into it. And really the main thing is that you want people to plant roses in your garden. Yeah. This is the main impetus of this. Yeah, we are the rose city. <laughs> and it's a chance to, you know, even though you may not think your garden looks as good, and what I often tell people is you've always been going to, you know, I should replace that rose, I should do this, I should <laughs> do that. Well, this, you can get it done now and it's done for the year. And the contest goes on, and uh, has to be deadline, uh, postmarked uh, May 21st. Can anyone enter that lives in Washington and Oregon? As long as they are within 20 miles of Pioneer Square. They have to be within that radius. Uh, and so you can go to the website to uh, check the, that out? Yes, the Royal Rosarian uh, website. Click on the event uh, tab and then the Rose Garden uh, tab and you can enter right online. Oh, that's even easier. Yep. <laughs> Well, you know, if you have any interest in this, and really, I think so many people, you have so many roses in your garden. If you go out and count them, you're going to be in one of the categories. So go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website, and you can sign up today. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Judy. You know, one of the funnest birds to watch in your gardens are hummingbirds, and I'm here with Scott at Backyard Bird Shop. And Scott, we're going to be talking today about hummingbirds, uh, going to get rid of some myths maybe and, and give some information out about them. So what's the first thing that I should be thinking about if I want to start attracting hummingbirds to me? To okay, my well, William, there are hummingbirds all over the place, especially this time of year when we have two species of hummingbirds here. Our, Rufus, bird, Rufus hummingbird, which is here just during the summertime, and uh -huh. then the Annas, which is here 12 months out of the year. Nice. So um, they're here, and um, they're in your yard. They're looking for food, nectar, and flowers. They're also taking insects. That's a major part of their diet, small flying insects. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we want to do is put out a hummingbird feeder, and uh, they will come. They are always looking for food all during the daylight hours. Uh, so they're not that hard to attract and they're quite fun to watch. And I'm assuming that this whole variety of stuff is hummingbird feeders right here. Yeah, we, we have, at Backyard Bird Shop, we have about 75 different wow. hummingbird feeders. <laughs> but we have some favorites that I have. Uh, particularly, um, I love these little small saucer type feeders. They're very easy to clean, mm -hmm. uh, very easy to open and get into. And the hummingbirds just love them. They perch on the ring here and uh, take the nectar from them. And then I, I noticed that you have an umbrella here. What would that be for? The umbrella, thank you for asking that question. The umbrella in our uh, wetter than normal climate um, shields the hummingbird feeder from the rain and therefore prevents the nectar from being diluted. Oh, okay. So that makes sense. And we have a, a number of these uh, different colors, different styles, but basically the idea is to keep the, the nectar um, at a four to one ratio. Well, and you've got, you know, if you have a lot of them, you could go up in size to get a larger one, but explain this cap to me. I don't understand that. Uh, William, this is a built-in ant moat. So in the summertime, the sugar ants are attracted also to the sure. nectar. And so a hummingbird feeder with a moat on top, an ant moat, you fill this with water and then the hummingbirds, the ants come down the cord and cannot get to the the nectar actually. So, so, it's, so it really is a, a moat to protect from ants. It's a major <laughs> deterrent, yes. And for people who already have a um, hummingbird feeder, you just attach this to the top. Uh, okay. And then that prevents the same thing from happening. Well, now, speaking of feeding, let, let's, you know, we've had, I personally have heard of a lot of, of kind of criticism of feeding hummingbirds like this because they're not getting protein, that's not the nutrition, they'll get used to only feeding off here and then they'll get, you know, sick. Give us some information, help us sort out that. We hear that question a lot too in our stores and um, essentially birds, not just hummingbirds, but birds are programmed not to rely upon one source of food. Yeah. And it's so logical because if they did in nature, if they're feeding on a flower, that flower quits blooming or it qu quits producing seeds. And so therefore they wouldn't have any food sure. if they were reliant on that thing. one flower. Yeah, that makes sense. So typically birds have a feeding territory, hummingbirds as well as all songbirds. And they're moving through that feeding territory all through the day. And that way if one source dries up, they still have others. And it's true with hummingbird feeders. So they really are kind of smarter than us humans in that respect. Because sometimes, you know, we get used to one thing and go over and over. Oh, they're not going to do that. This is true. Yeah. Well, now, I, I noticed that this is adorable. Tell us about this. 
This, um, <laughs> I was a skeptic myself. This is <laughs> Pop's Hummingbird Swing. And basically, if you've watched hummingbirds, they always, once they identify a food source, they begin to guard that food yeah. source. And so they'll perch in a tree nearby. Well, they are territorial. They are such a tiny little very creature. Territorial. <laughs> They're the terriers of the bird world. Well, you hang Pop's um, hummingbird swing near your hummingbird feeder, and this gives the little guy a place to perch and guard his food source. And even though you were, you were doubtful, it actually worked. It actually worked. Well, certainly if you have any other questions about not only hummingbirds and regular other types of birds, but attracting wildlife to your gardens, you can go to any of the locations at Backyard Bird Shops and talk to their excellent staff. And to find those locations, you go to gardentime.tv. Scott, thank you so much, my friend. Thank Always you, Always a William. pleasure. Success in the garden starts with the right plant in the right place. Farmington Gardens can help you succeed in planting and selecting for any corner of your garden. Spring is a fantastic time of year. Colorful, fresh, fragrant. And Farmington Gardens will help you revitalize your garden. So let's get started. We're here to help. Open every day and just a short drive out Farmington Road. Farmington Gardens, we're growing for you. Why let the weather dictate when you can enjoy your garden? With a greenhouse by Solar Gem, you don't have to. Grow your dream garden year round right in your own backyard. Our long lasting fiberglass greenhouses are made for gardening enthusiasts of all skill levels and delivered right to your home. Solar Gem greenhouses need no assembly, are virtually maintenance free, and come with a limited lifetime warranty. Call us at 800 383 3055 or find us on the web at solargemgreenhouses.com. Celebrate a spring tradition, visit the Olda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holda's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Since 1937, our family has been deeply rooted in the Northwest nursery industry. Our love of plants goes back four generations. To this day, Garland Nursery inspires to bring you the very best variety of plants, top quality garden supplies, and all the pieces you need to create a beautiful and bountiful garden. Garland Nursery, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. I'm at Hughes Water Gardens with Eamon Hughes, and Eamon, you know, we all love our ponds. We love to see that water and hear it, but I really love plants in my ponds. So you have some ideas about plants, and you know, the main thing is, why do we even want to put plants in the ponds? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of the practical reasons to have plants in ponds is it locks up a lot of the nutrients from the water, from the fish waste and everything else, and that helps prevent the algae. It also provides cover for your fish. Mm. The little baby fish will go in there and hang out, tadpoles and stuff like that. Ah. Uh, but the big reason is aesthetics. You know, it really enhances your pond. It brings a lot of extra value to, to your viewing. So it is important when you're planting your pond to plan ahead so you know what's going to happen with individual plants. Sure. So you don't look from your patio <laughs> and you can't see anything. You'd have to, <laughs> where's, my, where's my waterfall? You of know? course, of course. So that, that is important in Valeria. Sure, it's just like any other garden. You just want to make sure that you know the heights of them or when they're going to flower or what, what their pattern is, what their and habit. What the pattern is. And there are things like these creeping jennies, plants like this that are very low. Mm -hmm. uh, these have a yellow flower on them. And what these will do is just in the foreground of your pond, they'll cover all of that and soften the rock work there. And then from that, you can transition up into a medium growing plant. Uh, like an iris. Oh, it's a beautiful? beautiful. It's not a beautiful mm -hmm. color. Very pretty. And you know, in spring, you have this flowering probably for about three, four weeks, you'll have continual flower on your irises. But then even the rest of the year, the foliage is very attractive nice on, on the side of the pond. Mm -hmm. And you have some other texture plants there too. You have some other, you know, you have <laughs> some unusual things. This is a, oh, wow. I like a blatilla. It's a water orchid. Wow. Uh, now, it doesn't take a lot of water. It can take water on the base of it but it doesn't want to be buried deep into the water. So what is important when people are choosing their water plants is to check whatever nourishment they're going to, how much water above the top of the pot can I put in 
for that particular plant. Oh, because some plants want to be deep, like water lilies, yeah. but then some want to be on the edge. Yeah, and the edge plants vary a little. Some mm -hmm. will take as much as six inches of water over the top of them. Wow. Others only want their roots in the water. The irises tend to be more surface out of the water, mm -hmm. the, the top of it, and then their roots down into the water. Oh, what else do you have? And then the other important thing is winter, winter <laughs> interest. Sure. Because it's certain things like the blatilla and the caltha, the yellow flowering caltha here, will all die down for winter. So we want to have some winter interest. And there's a lot of local plants. This one here is the blue spreading rush. Really pretty blue foliage on that it. Is. And this is winter all year round. Evergreen. So mm -hmm. you don't have a flower or an ink, uh, nothing, uh, showy. Uh, nothing showy. Yeah. But you have form. Right, that so, is so nice. So you can pick things like that that will give you that structure all winter and then you can infill with the other things that will die down for, you know, later. And really you have such a big selection here and you have them in smaller sizes, you have them in bigger sizes, so yeah. really for any kind of size pond or even if you do a, a pot water garden. To do a pot, the, the little four inch size is very good for a, for a small pot garden if you're doing a bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are also very economical to buy and then put into a bigger pot sure. and put into your pond rather than paying uh, the nursery to upsize them for you. And it is also important to feed these plants when they go in the water. Okay. Even though they're knocking up some of the nutrient from the water, they're not getting enough of the trace elements. So there are special little tablets, aquatic plant tabs, that you just stick down into them, two or three to a pot probably every second month, and that will ensure you're getting plenty of good growth coming on the plants. Right, because you want them to look their best, because it's probably a focal point of your garden, your water feature. Yeah. One point I want to mention on water tablets, you'll often see tablets available at the garden centres, but they must be aquatic. Oh, sure. And the reason for that is a lot of the terrestrial plant tabs have copper or zinc in them, mm. and that'll kill your fish if you have fish in there. Oh wow, so that's really so, good to remember. Yeah, the, the aquatic tabs don't have the poisonous elements in them. Uh, always yeah. something to remember. There's always. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you go to Hughes Water Garden's website and see when their classes are, or come out and talk to staff, you can really get all those tips and all that information to have a beautiful pond this summer. Thanks so uh, much. Thanks so much, Judy. For over 75 years, Collier Arbor Care has provided tree, shrub, and lawn care services to the Portland metro area. From large tree to small shrub pruning, tree removal and stump grinding, we can handle all your tree care needs. Our arborists diagnose and treat your toughest insect and disease problems. We also have organic solutions for growing and maintaining healthy lawns, as well as organic nutrition for your trees and shrubs. Collier Arbor Care, environmentally friendly since 1937. Professionals have grown with DRAM watering tools for over 65 years. Discover the quality of DRAM. Nurture your plants with a shower of rain. Select from nine water patterns. Care for your lawn with quality that will last a lifetime. DRAM, the professional's choice for lawn and garden at a fine garden center near you. Don't you just love all the things inside Garden Time magazine? So much great information about gardening. I do, William. There's new plants, adventures, recipes, local gardeners, home tips. And it's free, right in your email. But there's two things you left out. What's that? <laughs> you and me. <laughs> we write some of the articles and get to share our gardening knowledge. Of course, I should have. William, where did you go? Right here, Judy. You'll find both of us every month in Garden Time magazine. Sign up for your free subscription on the Garden Time website. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here with Rosie from n and Herbs. And you know, Rosie, people do know you for herbs, but behind us is some beautiful plants you guys have expanded into, you know, starting to grow too for people. Right. Tropicals, specialty perennials, anything that's pretty, not just smelly and that's good for you. Well, let's get back to the smelly <laughs> stuff, yes, though, the stuff yes. that tastes good, which are herbs. Now, here's a beautiful kind of oval-shaped pot with a, a lot of variety in it. Exactly. And that's really for convenience to have close to your door if you use a lot of different spices mm -hmm. and you know, and all of it's great because once you start using fresh herbs, that's the only way to it go. It makes such a difference yeah, in, in the kitchen. It really does. Yeah. And you can take, you know, pretty much anything that you think you're going to use a lot and just pop them into a container. Exactly. No rules, no nothing. And they do, you know, a pot this size, it 
it's not very big, but you can put up six, seven plants in here, and it'll last you generally between six months and a year. And because they just, really don't mind being tied. No, 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 no. And they just, you know, just make sure you water it and fertilize it, and that's all it needs. And nice. they'll keep doing their thing. And you want to keep harvesting sure, too. Sure, sure. And yeah. that brings us to what we're going to really talk about today, which is a single type of herb in a pot. So before we plant this up, tell us why that's a good idea. Well, like myself, you know, I don't necessarily use a variety of herbs and yes they're beautiful but I just want to go after what I'm going to use in my everyday cooking sure. and so cilantro that is a must all the time and I will just take three nice full plants or four or depending on what size of pot you pick out. Because this looks about what is it six or it's eight like inch? It's like an eight inch pot and I'm just gonna put it in here sometimes I mean Sometimes cilantro, I've just been known to leave in the four inch pots and keep harvesting. <laughs> right outside the back door. Yeah, huh? <laughs> exactly. But this way, it'll last me. You know, it'll go for quite a while. And cilantro, by the way, this is the time to plant it. Sure. The frost doesn't bother it. You just have it outdoors. You cut it. It comes back within a week. And you want to keep using it because when it gets hot or it's day length sensitive, so as soon as our days are, start getting shorter, cilantro needs likes to go to seed. Yeah. So then you're actually wanting to replace it like once a month. You'll yeah. get like four cuts out of it. But um, so let's say this is a little, just a little pot that mm -hmm. I'll have on my porch. And to harvest it, I'll just go. And this little bunch right here will make me like a quart of salsa. Now, and you're doing this, even even if you just had this on your patio, oh. or just planted it, you would still cut oh, the Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. You want to, because cilantro, once it gets three, four inches, you want to harvest it. Okay. Even if you're not going to use it, because it's just healthier, and it grows back so fast. And if you, if you like you said, you cook with it a lot, so every day you would be going out, and you just keep going yep, around. Yep, yep, yep. And then the next day, or the, you know, in a couple of days, I'll harvest the other one. By the end of the week, this one will start filling Already out. Already replenished. Yeah, itself. so I will, depending on how much, you know, how much cilantro you use, um, I'll, you just, um, you can use a bigger pot and put sure. seven. It doesn't have to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the idea is. As you is, said, you had a whole flat out. Right, of right. <laughs> and the idea is, is that it's so fresh all the time. Yeah. If you buy it in the grocery store, yes, it's fresh maybe the day before, but we don't know how long it's been harvested. Exactly. So over here, and that goes basic, the same idea with all the other herbs. Yeah, you can pick up anything if you love, if you love parsley, if you yep. love basil, when exactly. it gets a little warmer, any of that, just cram in yep. there. Exactly, and then that'll just give you an abundance. And it hopefully will encourage people to use it more fresh, because exactly. it really makes yeah, a huge yeah. difference. I mean, if you have your cilantro right now in your garden, and it's been raining for 30 days, <laughs> And you're like, where is my garden? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's just great having it next to your porch and any and, type and of. And so herbs. convenient. Well, you know, for more information, you go to GardenTime.tv. It's always a pleasure coming out here, and thanks for the great, uh, great flavors for our kitchen. Yeah, thanks, William. <laughs>
Parr Lumber is celebrating 85 years as a local, family-owned company. From our house to yours, we send a heartfelt thank you. Surround yourself with wonderful color this summer. It's time for the annual spring sale at Hydrangeas Plus. Hydrangeas are the perfect plant for any garden, large or small. We are cleaning out our nursery, so come and take some plants home to your garden. We're offering special, once a year pricing on nearly everything we grow. Also, check out our selection of grasses and other blooming perennials. It's the annual spring sale at Hydrangeas Plus. For over 25 years, French Prairie Gardens has brought your family the best from the farm and from the market. Spring is bursting out all over. Come and see our wide selection of hanging baskets and bedding plants. Sign up for our CSA program and get fresh vegetables every week throughout the summer. And don't forget our bakery for a tasty treat to take home. Experience the best the country has to offer at French Prairie Gardens. Find us online at fpgardens.com. Celebrate a spring tradition. Visit the Old Eclager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holda's Victorian home, and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Garden Time's Incredible Edibles! So we are at Standard TV and Appliance, and I'm here with our good friend, Chef David Musial. And, and this book came to us recently. It's called testosterone and it's a book specifically for men and with really easy recipes overall that that help us guys get in the kitchen and cook like it like is. we're chefs <laughs> what, what it's all about trying to get the men back in the kitchen so you went through this for us and you picked out something tell us which one you picked out I, I did what I picked out was uh, soft taco vegetable stir-fry um, a lot of people are trying to incorporate more vegetables Certainly. a little bit less meat so this actually is a great way to uh, serve your vegetables and they'll taste a lot better and what I like in this is that a lot of us are doing the meatless Monday. Yeah. So that's what this is about, meatless Monday. And then if you wanted meat, you could add it on Tuesday. Right. <laughs> For Taco Tuesday. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so now I have to say, I, it looks like you're going to do some sauteing. And David, that always kind of concerns me because I'm never quite sure how to do it right. So the, the main thing when you're sauteing is what you're trying to do is you want to cook things quickly. And you, sure. don't want to, you don't want to steam them. So you, you want to have a hot pan, you want to have a little bit of oil, and the, probably the biggest thing too is that you want to cook things in batches, you know, similar size cuts uh -huh. of vegetables and uh, similar size, you know, or type of density. So like on this, we got carrots, we got onions, and we have broccoli, and they're going to cook pretty fast. And I would have thought that onions would have been a softer density, but you have them in here with these. They are softer, but the thing about onions is that you want them to kind of sweeten up. Okay. Uh, so you want to cook them a little bit more. So they will get softer, but things like carrots are a really dense vegetable. And the broccoli, you know, some people don't like the stems. Sure, you know, certainly. Al dente. I actually like it that way. Well, I also noticed that you use avocado oil. Is What are the reasons for that? So it's an interesting oil. You know, the... the, the the principles behind a lot of them are what their smoke point is, or you know, when you get the smoke, and we have some here, this is a really hot pan. This has a really high smoke point. If I was to use something like butter or olive oil, this oh. pan would probably be black by now. Okay, and the flavor really isn't that noticeable? The flavor is really neutral. Okay. And, and it's also considered a more healthy oil. So how long do you think this, this, these harder vegetables will take This to is do? gonna take about three to four minutes. So All we're right. gonna let these go for about that long, and then we'll start adding the softer ones. Perfect. Oil. So David, it's been a few minutes now, and you think these are these are done? Yeah, you can see they're getting nice and brown. So now we can add the vegetables that are going to cook a lot quicker, especially things like mushrooms. Now here's another question I have when I've seen you do this. I always, in my mind, think that sautéing is really, really like hardly anything, but this is pretty full. It is, and it might be a little bit fuller than it really should be. And if you're concerned and you can't get enough uh, high heat on it, what you can do is cook it in batches. Okay. Cook one batch, take it out. But the, the pan's pretty hot, and th the way you can tell if there's a problem is you'll see a lot of moisture coming off. Uh -huh. What you don't want to do is steam. So okay. we're, not, we're actually not steaming, we're doing pretty good. And how, do, how are we choosing these vegetables? So most of these were from the recipe in the book. Um, I substituted a few, but basically what's ever in season, whatever you like. Okay, it's, easy. It, it, it's your choice. The key is to get those vegetables in the diet. Okay, so this will take a couple more minutes couple and we'll be minutes back and, we'll and be finish ready. this up, huh? You'll be eating. <laughs> So David, that, that looks like it's about done. It does, uh, they look really nice. They got some really nice brown color on them. So you want to cook them the way you like them. I sure. don't like 
mushy vegetables. Some people do, but so either taste one, see if it's got the right crunch or uh -huh. you know the doneness you like, or you can always insert a knife in and just see how easy okay. it goes in. The easier it goes in, the more they're done, right? They're, they're okay. done. Yep. So again, this is about as easy as it gets. So all we're going to do now is we're just going to throw them in a bowl, and then we're going to have you dress them. And what we're going to do is add a little bit of sour cream and a little bit of soy sauce. And that's already pre pre done right here, right? Yep, it is. So now while I do this, you have some tortillas here. Tell us about what you're going to do with so those. So it's just going to be a flour tortilla. If I was at home, I have a griddle that I normally use. But if you don't have a griddle and you want to heat it up, just throw it on your burner. If you have a really? gas burner, yeah, electric I feel ones, like I would burn them terribly well, if I did that. <laughs> you, you just got to turn them real quick. You're just trying to heat them a little bit and soften them. But again, like I said, if you have an electric burner, it won't work. It'll stick and So you have to either fire. use the fire or the skillet one? Yes. And then once that is warmed up, this all just goes into that? Yep. And then there's a little bit of Parmesan cheese. I love that this was called, this was called a taco of some kind, right? But soft it, taco. Soft taco. It really almost looks like an Asian meal, though. It does, and it's got the soy sauce. But oddly enough, I actually had fajitas one time up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and they used soy sauce, and I couldn't tell what the unusual taste uh, was. And, and it I was asked that? Them, and it was actually very good. So then we just fill this in a little bit with that? Yeah. And then if you like salsa, add a little salsa. And is there a specific kind? You have uh, La Victoria here. Yeah, it, I mean, it's whatever you like. Or if you don't like salsa, no salsa. Then you don't have to do salsa at all. And then, now, this, this is Parmesan. Again, another mixture of a different type of But of one cheese. of the things in the book is that they promote is, is different things and then try what you like. Yeah. So if you want to use cheddar, Monterey Jack, use what you want. Well, and speaking of trying what you, you like, I'm going to try this right, right now. Are your fingers crossed? <laughs> Not my recipe, but I cooked it. Oh my goodness. It's good? Yes. I mean, it really has great flavor. And, you know, I'm not a vegetarian, right. but right. I would eat that and be completely happy with yeah, that. Yeah, I think it's a great way to be able to incorporate vegetables. Yeah, it really is. Now, if you're one of those ladies out there who loves your guy, but you think, you know, he gets in the kitchen and he can't really do what I want him to do, get him this book and you can make him a chef in the kitchen. It's very <laughs> easy. Go to gardentime.tv. You figure out how you can get this for yourself. Thank you so much, Chef David. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>just love all the things inside Garden Time magazine. So much great information about gardening. I do, William. There's new plants, adventures, recipes, local gardeners, home tips. And it's free, right in your email. But there's two things you left out. What's that? <laughs> you and me. <laughs> we write some of the articles and get to share our gardening knowledge. Of course, I should have. William, where did you go? Right here, Judy. You'll find both of us every month in Garden Time magazine. Sign up for your free subscription on the Garden Time website. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.